Welcome to the future of the internet. What the f- Fallout New Vegas has its first downloadable content. Nintendo video games may be the most addictive toy in history. A quarter each for Escape, which can last a long time if you're skilled. How we consume and pay for video games and subsequently the content within them has changed dramatically over the years, from the explosion of arcades to the first popular home consoles and then onto the digital era of downloadable content, microtransactions and beyond. To understand where we're going, we need to look at where we came from. This is a brief history of video game monetization. A popular sentiment in today's video game landscape is that microtransactions are a new concept that ruined at least some aspects of gaming, particularly the ones that come from the largest companies in the industry. However, microtransactions are where games started and all we've done is go full circle. In fact, the first era of monetization in this industry is probably the worst one we've ever had. The first big boom of commercial gaming happened inside the arcade. The monetization here was simple and originated as many gaming innovations do in Japan. In 1965, an electromechanical arcade shooting submarine simulator would release, which was designed by Nakamura Manufacturing Co, which later went on to be known as Namco, a company you probably will have heard of. A year later, the game known domestically as Torpedo Shooter would go on to be redesigned by Sega Enterprises. They iterated upon the original three-player cumbersome machine to a single-player experience small enough that they could export to foreign markets. In 1968, the rebranded game now known as Periscope gave birth to the method of payment for an entire era, the quarter-fed arcade cabinet. This I would point to as the origin and the proof of concept for microtransactions in gaming, though instead of paying for a new skin or some additional content, you were paying for the ability to rent some game time. The games that followed Periscope's innovation would adopt this same model, and arcades started to pop up globally, competing mostly with other coin-fed operational games like slot machines and pinball. It wasn't, however, until the late 70s that the arcade golden era would begin. <laughs> Typically, for a market to truly explode, you need a catalyst. And for the arcade era, that would come in 1978. Taito, a Japanese company, released what many would consider to be the first blockbuster video game and the originator of the shoot 'em up genre. Space Invaders was the revolution. It was the herald of the arcade culture that would soon follow. Using the same cost prohibitive and incredibly expensive quarter per play model adopted a decade prior, Space Invaders would go on to raise over $3.8 billion in just four years, mostly in quarters. Adjusting this for inflation, this would be worth over $16 billion today and make Space Invaders still one of the highest grossing video games ever made over 44 years later. After the success of Space Invaders, the arcade industry exploded. It was only a matter of time until something else would come along and steal that mantle. Space Invaders seems boring, you know, you just shoot at the dudes, but Pac-Man, it's more exciting. Though Space Invaders developers will not be upset about their $3.8 billion in four years, it was put to shame by the success of Pac-Man with over $6 billion gross revenue in just two years. Arcades were absolutely booming at this time, and despite the prohibitive nature of what an arcade was, the model involved, they had taken over many other forms of entertainment and saw mainstream adoption. Now, in terms of the game design, we could probably draw a parallel between the popular roguelike genre now and what an arcade game actually was. You insert a coin for a set number of lives or time, and if you want to continue beyond those restrictions, you insert more coins, a pay-to-play experience during a time of inaccessible video game entertainment. If you were to transport this game mechanic to modern day gaming, people would call this the worst monetization they'd ever seen. So what made it okay back then, and why did it fall out of favour? Looking at this from both sides, the consumer and the service. First, the cost was necessary for arcade owners due to the massive overhead cost of maintaining a physical location. The power bills, the employees, the rent for buying cabinets of the newest games to stay relevant, maintenance of the cabinets, and more. They needed to charge what retrospectively was a ridiculous fee so they could operate such a risky business. As for why people would pay for these experiences, well, accessibility is likely the biggest factor. Home consoles has not really started to take off yet and their availability was pretty low. 
even if you were lucky enough to have one, the games available for those home consoles were oftentimes inferior to the ones that you would find in the arcade. And one of the most important elements, the social experience and cultural relevance of these blockbuster games in this new cool venue. Arcades were the in thing and these games were taking over. This made for the ability to charge substantial sums of money for essentially renting playtime and made it completely acceptable. Playtime that was often brutally difficult, a design that a cynical person might suggest was adopted to make consumers burn through their quarters faster in their pursuit of victory or mastery. The equivalent in 2022 would be you're playing Elden Ring, but every time you die, you have to slide a $2 bill adjusted for inflation into Gaben's G-string just to go again. Interestingly, the same reason people accepted this terrible monetization model was the same reason it saw a sharp decline immediately following the Golden Age. Accessibility made the arcades and it also killed them. As soon as you could buy a home console and play good games for a single purchase in the convenience of your own home with no limitations on game time or queuing up to play what was popular, arcades started to decline heavily and the risk that was associated that made those costs necessary was realized. This was observable at first with the release of the Nintendo Entertainment System, more commonly referred to as the NES in the mid to late 80s, and more so with the release of the Sega Genesis or Mega Drive depending on where you live, and the Super NES in the early 90s. The arcade industry clung onto life and even managed to have resurgences with super popular releases like Street Fighter 2 from Capcom, which did lend itself to playing in an arcade and something that is translated later in life to people buying the controls of the arcade to get that true experience it was designed for. But by the early 2000s, the once overstimulating lights and sounds of the arcade were being turned off one by one across the globe, never to be turned back on. Alongside the arcade industry's decline, the release of the NES and the IBM PC compatible games were showing another form of monetization that made a lot more sense for the consumer. You buy the platform for your home, you buy the cartridge or the software, the disc, and you play as much as you want. The NES was the third console generation and the one to shift the tides of industry in the favor of retail game purchasers from that previous coin-fed dominance. The NES gained the mainstream traction with games like Super Mario Bros, Duck Hunt, Super Mario Bros 2 and 3, Tetris, and The Legend of Zelda. Around the same time, the PC was considered one of the fastest growing gaming markets globally, but around 1987 when sales of the NES were peaking with the European launch, people in the industry believed that Nintendo's success had literally destroyed the PC ascension due to the lower price point, the easier compatibility, and again, the accessibility. In terms of the story of monetization though, both mediums maintained the status quo for monetization and this became the norm for over a decade. Each technological upgrade came with new hardware, new games, new accessories to purchase, but the principle remained the same. Console generations came and went without almost anything happening in this regard, from the Sega Genesis in 1988 to the Super Nintendo Entertainment System in 1990, all the way to the massive release of the Sony PlayStation in 1994. However, things were about to start changing drastically, and the catalyst at the centre of these changes was the internet. Before we had DLCs, before we had microtransactions on a large scale, expansion packs were the next sort of evolution of monetization, and though they existed as early as the late 80s, usually as free upgrades to existing games for PC, they became truly prominent and popular in 1996 with the release of Beyond the Dark Portal, the expansion for Warcraft 2 Tides of Darkness. This was the first real opportunity for companies to further monetize the experience beyond the widely accepted by the hardware, by the game formula. This just so happened to coincide with the rise of multiplayer gaming that was allowing the PC market to truly stand out from the offerings of consoles, which was mostly local co-op or single player. New genres were being born that existed to bring players together in online worlds, most notably the massively multiplayer online role-playing game, or MMORPG for short, which would rise to prominence in the mid to late 90s with games like Nexus The Kingdom of the Winds in South Korea and Ultima Online in the West. These games brought with them a method of monetization that had otherwise been mostly forgotten. Paying for time to play the game, with you losing the ability to play once that time ran out. Though instead of quarters in a slot, this was monthly subscriptions with a credit card. Now there are multiple examples of much smaller and more obscure experiences that charged by the hour prior to this 
but they are not notable in how they shifted the gaming monetization. As games like Ultima Online were showing you that a subscription model could work, a multi-user dungeon commonly referred to as a mod would begin testing what many consider the first ever true microtransactions. Arkeo Dreams of Divine Lands, a text-based game, auctioned off high-quality items from the game for real-world money. After figuring out that people would be willing to pay for these items and not only pay, but pay large sums of money, the developer then implemented the world's first dual currency system, one currency that is earned in-game and another that comes from real-world purchase. This, unlike the subscription model, didn't take off as quickly in the industry, but as computers and the internet were more widely available, so too were free-to-play browser games that implemented secondary currency and premium subscriptions of their own. The MMORPG genre was almost always at the forefront of bringing in popularity of alternative monetization, and it wasn't long until games like MapleStory would release to massive commercial success, using the free-to-play model of others before it, and bringing in huge profits from what some may refer to as a premium cash shop model. This is where things begin to move very quickly for monetization. From the late 90s to the early 2000s, we saw probably the biggest shift in monetization yet. The advancement of online games and what this brought to the table was soon adopted on consoles, with services like Xbox Live and their marketplace, as too was the ability to buy microtransactions to expand the lifespan of already developed games who to this point saw most of their sales in the first handful of months and little return after. The most well-known example of this, of course, is the fabled Elder Scrolls Oblivion Horse Armor DLC in 2006, though this was not the first, just the one that garnered all the attention when it released. While previously expansion packs would add potentially dozens of hours to the game experience or revamp online tools to refresh the player base, these DLCs were instead entirely cosmetic. If you were to believe online forums at the time or how people remember this, the horse armor was received extremely poorly. It was also one of the top selling DLCs made for the game even years later, when actual content had also been sold. A very clear success and an indicator that regardless of what you thought about it, people would buy it and it would continue. This DLC model was adopted by AAA Gaming over the next few years and eventually became not just commonplace, but expected as a default. At this time, the DLC offerings would mostly just add on to the game. However, developers only needed to glance over a browser and MMORPG games to see that players would be willing to pay for even more, given the option. And the option would be given more and more frequently, even in single player game. At this point, there was proof that players would not only pay for content for their games, but also cosmetics. Just three short years after the horse armor, FIFA 09 adopted the next model that would go on to raise billions for companies like EA. And of course, I'm talking about the loot box. This being a feature that had again been lifted from the MMORPG genre, and more specifically MapleStory Japan. Though of course the underlying mechanics of this feature could be seen in other industries for decades. By 2013, we also had the introduction of the Battle Pass, which came from Valve's Dota 2, which was originally called the Compendium and accompanied their yearly blockbuster tournament, commonly referred to as TI, short for The International. It wasn't long until gaming had grown into a monster of industry, bigger than ever before, bigger than the companies raising billions of dollars a year for the arcade cabinets, and companies being valued in the tens of billions of dollars, with yearly revenue growing consistently, to the point other entertainment industries were being eclipsed. With this growth, the availability of tools and of course the market for games that didn't house as many of these practices, we also saw the rise of the indie game, which is a massive market in and of itself as of 2022. Now this is what I believe to be a condensed version of the history of monetization, but this isn't where the road ends. There's another large shift looming on the horizon, and it is unfortunately called blockchain. I believe if you learn anything from the Oblivion horse armor situation, it should be that regardless of how loud the shouting is, if there's money being made, if there's people willing to buy something, it will most likely be pushed by the companies that stand to make the money. Eventually, people come to terms with things, they accept them as the norm. Things like DLCs, loot box, microtransactions, and the goalposts move from what is a good DLC versus what is a bad DLC, what is a good NFT 
what is a bad NFT. This hopefully is not a guarantee, but it does seem to be where the monetization arrow is pointing, at least for now. People are shouting right now about NFTs and cryptocurrency, this looming threat known as play to earn, and yet some of the biggest companies in the industry are seemingly embracing it with open arms. It's been three decades since the CoinFed arcade model was replaced by something many, including myself, would consider to just be a much better overall model, and it will be interesting to see where we go from here. This is the part where maybe you get jaded, but I'll offer you some perspective that may help. While ever there is a market of people who have money to spend and refuse to adopt the new direction they dislike, there will be companies that pop up to serve you. We've got more choice of games than ever before, more access to AA and indie developed projects that give us the experience of buy and play with nothing additional added, and that will continue to increase in number and quality so long as the market of consumers that support that continue to do so. Once a company gets too big, they will most likely adopt the positions of the current AAA industry, but another will pop up to replace them. Just like loot boxes, DLCs, or anything else wasn't the end of you having fun in gaming, I don't think NFTs or blockchain will either. This is the history, or at least a large portion of the history, of video game monetization. I find things like this super helpful to research, to just look at and say, this is where we were, this is where we've been, and this could be where we end up. I believe the industry is too big now to hope that there will be a continuation of that cycle and we go back to purely buying a game and purely buying a console, but at least with how big the industry is, we also now have the choice as individuals, what we can accept, and more importantly, what we can enjoy. Say no to play to earn. Thank you very much for watching. See you on the next one. Stay safe out there. Peace.